Hi, and welcome to Something to Talk About. I'm Linda McNamee, and for the next hour, we are going to talk about some issues with women's health. But before we get begin that, as usual, I have a few housekeeping things to take care of. If you would like to give us a phone call tonight, we are live, and you can give us a call at 781-270-9199. I always forget that number because I never call. Or you can email me at talk at bcattv.org if you have a suggestion for a future topic, if you have a question after the fact, or just have a comment, I love to get email. And I would like to thank our crew this evening for giving up their Wednesday evening to come here and help us out. We have staff members Chris Flaherty and Corey McNeil who help keep BCAT running smoothly. We have Maddie Shipka, who is director extraordinaire this evening, in for Colleen Moore, who is vacationing. And we also have Jolie Atwood, who is helping us out with camera. And Jolie likes to hang out here too. She's one of my regular crew. So thank you, everyone. And last but definitely, definitely not least, I would like to thank my husband, Paul, for staying home for daddy date night. Hopefully the kids are behaving themselves and hopefully they will go to bed soon be after picking up the Legos. So now I would like to introduce my wonderful guests for this evening. We have Tanaz Frizzandi, who's returning. You were here about a year and a half ago. Yeah, yeah. And we have Deb Carr, who works with Tanaz. And both of you work at Tufts Medical Center. We do, yes. In the urogynecology department. Yes. That's hard to say. It's a lot of words. Okay. It's nope. urogynecology and recon reconstructive pelvic surgery, so it's a lot. So, we so just you get say paid per, you know, time. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> no. It was a joke. Oh, it was a joke. Okay, now before we delve into the subject at hand, can you guys tell me, ladies, sorry, um, can you tell me a little bit about yourselves, where you grew up, what, um, how you came to the New England, Massachusetts area, and how you got involved and decided to work in the field of urogynecology. Why don't you start with you, Deb, because you have a different route than I do. I grew up in Massachusetts, mm. and I had worked as a nurse in an ambulatory internal medicine. Ooh. And no the stress there. The woman that I worked with, who was a nurse practitioner, said to me, you know, you are telling people the same thing I tell them, but you're never going to get the recognition. You really need to go to school. And I thought, oh, this doesn't sound like it will be easy because I was a single mom with a teenager, but Ooh. did it. Wow. So I graduated from Northeastern. Um, I did the five-year plan one at a time <laughs> and um, was involved in internal medicine for a number of years. Oh, wow. And there was an opening at uh, the Brigham and Women's for Eurogyne. And I thought, mm. I've never tried that. Let's see what that's like. So <laughs> that was how I got into Eurogynecology. Now, did you have to go back to school again? I did not. Okay. I did not. I had excellent teachers. I had a great mentor. Um, and they were willing to teach. So it it was a, a great excellent. fit. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. No so, looking back. Yep. And then. I needed a change, and so Tanaz was looking for help. The breast is history. Here, go ahead, twist my arm. Go I, ahead. I needed a lot of help. <laughs> hey, it worked. So, so I, I love t telling my patients that actually Deb has more urogyne experience than I do. Um, she does. She does. Um, so I had a more traditional route for a physician. I I grew up in the Midwest, so I'm I'm not um, a northeasterner by um, upbringing. Um, grew up in the um, Midwest, and I came out here for my intern year after finishing medical school. Okay. So I trained at the BI, and I did my um, residency. And so you're a gynecologist. It's, it's a new boarded specialty. Um, I okay. always say, in deference to my um, teachers, a lot of them did all the things that I do, except they didn't need to do a fellowship at the time, and, and things have changed a little bit. Okay. So we do require a fellowship for most people practicing now, and, and I can kind of dive into a little bit of um, some other general OBGYNs that do what I do as well. Um, so my path was doing four years of an OBGYN residency, and then I did a three-year fellowship in urogynecology oh, and pelvic okay. reconstructive surgery. Some of your audience may also encounter people like myself, and um, they'll go under the moniker of female pelvic medicine, 
um, and reconstructive surgery. A lot um, that's okay. a mouthful, but it's um, At some point this evening. I want to talk about the reconstructive part sure, because it sounds sure. like you know turning people bionic or something. Right, you know, right. we will putting, rebuild putting, her. Putting we will make her better than she was. Yeah, yeah. putting in hardware. Um, and so um, we did. I did the three years of fellowship and then um, started the division at Tufts. And okay. I was by myself for a couple of years, and at that point, it became very clear that I needed some help. And Deb was fantastic. And I think what's important in my line of work as well, we're primarily a surgical department. We take care of a lot of women who have a lot of what we call comorbidities, a lot of illnesses. And okay. so, you know, Deb's experience in internal medicine, primary care, I mean, she's done travel clinic work. I mean, she's done wow. a lot of different things. And these things pop up on a regular basis, so we always kind of refer, refer to her <laughs> oh, too. Deb. <laughs> oh, Deb! There's a lot of knocking oh, on the door. There's a lot of Odeb. Yeah, there's a lot of Odeb. Um, and, and it's challenging because even though we are so ultra-specialized, our patients are not simple. Right. And they can be challenging in themselves. And um, it keeps us on our toes on a regular basis. Never um, a so, dull moment. Yeah, and so that's that's your gynecology in a nutshell, as your audience may or may not know of it, or as I said, fe female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. There's another route that some your gynecologists can take, mm -hmm. which is a different path in their training, which is after medical school, they did a urology fellow, um, residency. Okay. And that varies, but it's generally about five years. And so they took the, the urology route where they now, then- Now, is urology like co-ed patients they, it, yes. Okay. Yes, they can. They're primarily, you know, obviously it's primarily, but they can see some women, and when they they then move on and do a female urology fellowship. Okay. But what's been going on um, across the country? They've been trying to standardize this um, this discipline, mm -hmm. and a lot of programs have combined the two disciplines. So oh. I came through the OBGYN route, and oh, okay. some of my colleagues have come through the urology route. Um, you know, our training is different. Um, so. What I tell even my students is we only take care of women. Um, okay. We don't have men in our in our patient cohort. Mm -hmm. um, and even though we do some of the things that inter you know interact with what urologists do, we don't take care of say kidney stones, bla you know bladder stones. We certainly don't take care of bladder cancers or you know upper okay. renal tract cancers. Do you deal with cancers at all? Not really. Okay. No. We usually we're kind of the gateway people, and so when we do find uh, them, we okay. then refer them to either GYN oncology or to uh, our urology okay. colleagues, and so we we kind of manage those and triage okay. those appropriately. But we see a lot of, I mean, we just found one the other day, you know, mm. and it's one of those things where a patient came in with what seemed to be very simple complaints of urinary urgency and frequency, and we did what's called a cystoscopy, which is taking a small camera in the clinic and looking directly into her mm -hmm. bladder, and we found a tumor. So wow. I just ran into her surgeon this morning as we were operating, and he's taking her to the OR to have it removed. So it's, it's a very fluid movement oh, um, okay. amongst the disciplines. And so I think, you know, to talk about what we do, we, we primarily deal with women who have urinary incontinence, okay. um, women who have prolapse, Okay. And then we also deal with women who have symptoms that are related to the bowel function. Okay. And so that caused us actually at Tufts to create what we call um, the Center for Pelvic Health, um, which we wanted to really create that brand because we already did all of the services that we are creating okay. within the center, and so we um, we have. Now you have to market it. You know? We're marketing, but yeah. we're also trying to get the word out that okay. you know. Which is why you're here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but part of it is we realized that we were seeing so many patients within our clinic. We were then, tra you know, referring them to colorectal surgery because they had a lot of pelvic floor issues. Okay. And then there were some of them were going to the gastroenterologist, the GI clinic, and so we realized that the three disciplines were. So what we've decided to do is create the Center for Pelvic Health, and we meet on a regular basis now. Mm. And we have a list okay. of all the patients that are going within the disciplines. Uh, Okay. And so we sit down in a room across the table from each other and talk about every single patient that's that's wow. shared. Okay. And um, it's it's been really really great because the conversations have been very helpful and we know these patients and you know and the patients probably appreciate they, that they because do because we're talking amongst ourselves and you know just last week we had a very big combined case with colorectal, so it was nice that we we could do our part colorectal. Dr. Chen came in and did her part, did the procedure together. We did it robotically. It went really smoothly for the patient. Wow. So I think I think we're making a lot of progress, kind of breaking down some of the barriers and the walls between the disciplines, and um, I think the, the biggest benefit is for the patients, okay. and that's been 
very gratifying for us, I think. Okay, now just backing up a teeny bit, looking at the Tufts website and looking at your web page, are you also an instructor? Yes. So you're practicing medicine part time and then like lecturing, or do you just have That's like. That's part of it, right? So okay. as. When do you have time to do all of this? Well, it's, it's actually. <laughs> It take, everything <laughs> takes time, right? Um, it's um, when you choose to work at an academic medical center. So we have okay. several in the Boston area. And when you choose to work at an academic medical center, especially those that are affiliated with a medical school, because there are some um, community centers that also have okay. residency programs, but we are at an academic center that is affiliated with a medical school. And as such, um, you know, Deb and I and my partner, um, Dr. Patterson, we have students that come through as part of their rotation. Okay. Um, so they're learning the basics of OBGYN because we're part of the OBGYN oh, department. Okay. Um, and then they come to our clinic because it's a specialty clinic and we share space with the, gynecolo um, the GYN oncologists who do the cancer for GYN. And so they share and learn from all of us. Mm -hmm. So they're in our clinics, they go to the operating room with us. Okay. Um, if we have consults on the floor, they do that. Um, we also have residents because we are a training program, and so okay. we always have um, an intern and a chief on our service um, helping us manage learning. So it's while we do discrete what we call didactics, you know, every so many weeks I lecture to the students, you know, okay. in a classroom setting, um, and every so often I lecture to the residents in a classroom setting, but I would suggest that on a regular basis, Deb and I have students and residents with us at all times, oh, okay. and so we're, they're just learning as they're watching us. And sometimes that's easier to learn. Well, it's real time. It makes sense. Yeah. exactly. It's real, real time. time. It is. And I think um, you know Deb does a lot of the non-surgical management for, say, prolapse, so a lot okay. of pest reuse and things like that. And I tell my students and my residents, you know, I do more of the surgical side of things. They absolutely need to go with Deb's because. There isn't just you know one size fits all. We right. have to manage patients very differently, and so she does one component of their care. And by the time they need surgery, it's probably yep. you know like. And some people just don't want surgery, and so okay. Deb offers them a lot of the non-surgical approaches. Okay. And and so it bodes well for everybody. Uh, okay. You're just going on, and I'm like, okay. I feel like these are just so random now. Um, the age of your patients, it, do they tend to be older, younger, and also like ethnic diversity? Do, do you find like patterns in your, in who happens exactly. to be your patients? Teenagers until Everything. over 100 years old. Wow. Yeah, we have a couple of lovely ladies who are in that category, yeah. And <laughs> that must be fun. And you have your neighborhoods, so it's Chinatown. South okay. Boston. People have been um, affiliated with Tufts for many years uh -huh. and okay. have such um, strong feelings about that that they will drive from New Hampshire, Maine, Rhode Island, wow. Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket. And it's funny because I will say to them, you couldn't find a doctor down Nobody's there? Nobody's closer than, <laughs> than <laughs> us? <laughs> no, no, I want to come mm. and see you. Okay. Wow. So and, and there aren't too many people that do specifically what we do. So oh, okay. that definitely has posed a challenge for a lot of people. And that's actually driven our model to try and open up satellites oh. to try and get get more access to the patients. Now, have you opened some of these satellites? Mm -hmm. or? Mm -hmm. We currently have three that we've opened outside of Boston. Wow. So we you know we have one in Braintree, we have one in Norfolk, and we have one in Wellesley that's opening up. And so Excellent. Um, you know, we can only get stretched so far. Understood. But it's been, you know, when you, when you ask that question, it is challenging because while the majority of our patients are, quote, older, mm -hmm. I would say what Deb said, we have, the youngest I think we've had in our practice is almost about 13. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it, it's a big, it's a big, big range. Um, okay. But I would say it's usually women of childbearing age and older that we see in our practice. Okay. Um, the ethnic diversity question is always challenging because, well, in Boston, you know, as, as Deb mentioned, we are in a certain demographic. But what we find and the reason we like doing these sorts of um, outreach programs is we're trying to get the word out as well. You know, there are a lot of cultural barriers, socioeconomic barriers to access and health care. Mm -hmm. And especially for something like what we do, a lot of women will say, you know, well, this is what's happening. 
I'm just, this is what I'm expected to have happen to my body when I'm getting older. And they don't recognize that there are things that we can offer mm -hmm. them. Um, and then certainly with certain ethnic groups, it's um, talking it's about female issues. A lot of times, it's just exactly taboo. It that's it's embarrassing. exactly what I mean, it is. Recently in the They're Olympics, so, so wasn't taboo. there like this big issue that the I think swimmer. it was a swimmer from yes. China or yes. something? And she's like, "Sorry, I'm not feeling great today. I got my period." And they're like, mm. right. "So, right." So those are a lot yeah. of the things that we're trying really hard to get the word out, um, even in, even in our own neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what's been nice, and I'm seeing a little bit more and more of it, is while some of our older ladies, you know, it's, it's a little bit of the stiff upper lip crowd. Mm -hmm. They don't complain. You know, they see all of this as complaining. Well, I'm, you know, I'm not dying, so this is all fine. Yeah. Um, but I think their children who are now caring for them are bringing them in. Oh, and so okay. that's been very helpful because mm -hmm. we have a lot of patients that we've taken care of, and they're like, you know, I'm going to bring my mom in or I'm going to bring my aunt in. Mm -hmm. She needs to have this taken care of. So it's really trying okay. to get the word out. And our societies are doing... I think a good job trying to get that um, message across the board to everybody. I see that as what's changed actually in doing this for about 12 years. I think it's gotten progressively better that women will open up um, and say a little bit more. And maybe it is, you know, in response to a daughter who has said, mm -hmm. Mom, I'm tired of going out and buying diapers for you. Yeah. Um, let's do something about this, but um, they're, they're talking about it more. Okay. And there's always one who will be the guinea pig, whether it's the woman that's at the gym and all of the other women at the gym or the family members are saying, well, I'll wait until you have your surgery yeah. and then see how that goes and we'll take it from there. Hmm. Okay, so let's start talking about some of the issues that you actually talk about uh, that you actually treat again uh, just browsing on your website pelvic floor disorders what what is what is that ha, define that or what incorporates that I know that could probably be a whole series in itself but I think it's it's a catch-all phrase okay to a certain degree and what we're trying to say is that a lot of things fall under the umbrella of pelvic floor disorders so okay. um, Ladder issues, urinary okay. incontinence, certain types of leakage, um, overactive bladder. You know, a lot of people have that at various points in their in their life where people feel that urge, um, mm -hmm. and they go to the bathroom frequently. Um, but if you watch TV, oh, there's a pill to take care of that. That's <laughs> that's a good point, and we can talk about it. I, I will say that it's interesting because that that big big industry push um, on the medications, I think, has raised a little bit of awareness. Oh. And that's actually maybe brought some people in that oh, I think okay. that kind of embarrassment taboo has been whittled away a little bit oh, from, okay. from the fact that there's advertising now. Um, you know, on the male side, goodness mm -hmm. knows, everybody knows that you know, there's the, yeah. the Viagra commercials and mm -hmm. all of that that people see. And I think the taboos are going away where I think that's helped access a little bit, okay. I think. Um, so the pelvic floor disorders, we're talking about the, the bladder issues, the incontinence issues, frequency urgency. Um, and then we deal with prolapse, whether okay. someone still has a uterus in place or they've had a hysterectomy in the past, but it's the, the support of the pelvic floor, the muscles okay. and the tissues that give us support when we're younger, whether it's with injuries, aging, pregnancies, there are a lot of different risk mm -hmm. factors we can talk about. And so women will get what they call prolapse. And the simplest way to kind of define that is to say that um, it's herniation of tissue coming out of okay. a woman's vagina. You can also have prolapse from the urethra. You can also have prolapse from the rectum. Wow. And so, again, we're Pretty still complicated. It's Probably very yeah. complicated down there. <laughs> and um, and so we also, that's why we deal very, very closely with the colorectal surgeons at work okay. because sometimes patients will come to us thinking they're having prolapse from one compartment. We examine them and we realize it's actually the other compartment. And trust me, it's, mm -hmm. it's always, it's really horrifying for Are our patients. Are they like tests or is it like? It's exams. Okay. Exams. Exams. It's the good old fashioned okay. eye exam and we examine our patients. Uh, okay. We have them do some maneuvers to see if we can demonstrate what they're feeling. Um, and then I think the big challenge a lot of us feel is like um, defecatory dysfunction, bowel dysfunction. Um, you know, whether it's the constipation, feeling obstructed, diarrhea problems, all of those also. How much of this is related to diet though? Some of it. 
some of it. That's why we work very closely with the GI people for mm -hmm. the bowel okay. issues. We work very close. That's why we have this stream of consciousness here. So that's why no. I, I mean, that's to but these are all the questions that we ask. I mean, we have okay. um, even in our intake form, we we have three pages on our intake form because it isn't it isn't clean at all. It's not black or white. It's, it's not at all. And mm -hmm. we we tend to ask these questions in various ways to try and get tease out what the information really is, okay. so we can direct our care appropriately. You know, I mean, I spent. I see the initial patients and I spend all of this time, okay, I'm, okay, this is what we need to do for you. Okay, you're gonna go see Deb for this. Okay, well, that's not what you have. We're gonna send you to the GI folks. Okay, that's not what you have. You may need to go to urology. You may need to go to colorectal. So there's there's a lot of fluidity and we spend a lot of time with our initial visits just okay. trying to tease out the problem. You know, someone can come and say to us, oh, I have a, a bladder issue. Well, to to them, they have a bladder issue, absolutely, but to us, we really need to figure out what kind of bladder issue because the treatment plans that we offer are very oh, okay. divergent and very different. So it's it's all pelvic floor dysfunction. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, with the, specifically the prolapse is what I'm thinking, What are there women that are more susceptible to it, like women who have given birth or you know, over, does weight have something to do with it, or? I, I, I think you can keep going, and we'll just all keep of nodding. It, yeah. We'll just keep nodding, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. You, you're getting all the okay. right answers. <laughs> yeah. There's the genetics of our tissue. Okay. There's, you know, and oftentimes we don't know what mom or grandma had because people didn't talk about their right. vaginas. Right. There's right. Um, chronic constipation. There's the lifting. Think of what a mom lifts between the stroller, the baby, the car seat, the diaper bag. All of that <laughs> impacts that pelvic floor. Especially moms with like multiple kids. With you know. yes, mm -hmm. got yes. the two two and baby you know, buckets. I mean, yes, obesity. You know. And this obesity. The obesity is definitely now okay. playing a role. So there are clear risk factors. We know we know that we know um, childbirth. So we know that that's one. We know having numerous babies. Does it, okay, I was going to say, does like the number yeah. of pregnancies it, impact it? It can. Or? So I, you know, I, I, I would suggest that our older patients, you know, in that generation that had numerous babies, they had, you mm -hmm. know, several. Twelve. <laughs> exactly, right. Our grandmothers had, you know, my grandmother had like 11 or 12 children, right? Um, we don't see that as much anymore in a, our generation. Or maybe Two words, generation. college tuition. Exactly, exactly. And so... But what we are seeing is the babies have gotten bigger. They're larger okay. babies. Does that does that affect childbirth and how you are undergoing labor? Does that affect oh, okay. your pelvic floor? We think it does. Um, in the past, a lot of deliveries were done with um, these instruments called forceps, and we know that okay. that used to damage the pelvic floor. I think that's kind of also damaged the baby's head too. Yeah, and I think <laughs> that's that's kind of waning. We're not seeing that okay. as much. Um, Obesity, I think, is, is a huge factor these days. Okay. Um, Deb mentioned genetics. We know that there is something that runs in families. And in fact, a lot of times, if we get a very young patient, more times than not, they'll say that the mother had something done. You know, she doesn't know what. And Deb looked oh, at that. because we didn't talk about it. We didn't it. talk about it. And she's like, my mom had some sort of surgery to lift everything up. But, mm -hmm. you know, they don't know exactly what it was. Um, but I Staple always, gun. Well, exactly. And, but I, was Duct like, tape. I always put an asterisk to all of this, and I said, and yet we still don't understand everything because we have a couple of nuns in our practice, right? So what does that tell us? That tells us that it isn't the childbirth. It is. It is. I mean, th they're so not smoking. So then it's more generic. Genetic. So genetic. It may be something else going on, and we're still trying oh, to tease okay. that out. Um, and there's some data to suggest that that's going on, but okay. we're still not clear. Okay, what are some of the treatments, you know, that are available to women that encounter, you know, various forms of prolapse? So you want Do to you have to go that? straight to surgery? No, nope, not at all. Okay. No, you not can you can watch and wait and do absolutely nothing if you okay. are not impacted by this. Um, depending on the descent of that prolapse determines. Like, you know, is exercise a good thing or a bad thing in something like this? Well, uh, I use a lot of pelvic floor physical therapy. Okay. I, I believe in strengthening what we have. And um, we have, these are um, physical therapists that had an interest in women's health, mm -hmm. decided to go further, and they've created this specialty of pelvic floor physical therapy. They are still physical therapists, and they could, mm -hmm. you know, take care of your rotator cuff and your back, but 
they have this interest. And we have two that um, are in our practice on certain days of the week. And it's wonderful having them there because um, some women don't want to jump to that surgery decision. Mm -hmm. okay. They want to think about it. Well, yeah, um, any kind of surgery is... Right. It's mm -hmm. a big step. Mm -hmm. And until they're ready, um, you, you don't make that step. Then um, we have a device called a pessary. Um, and I have, I tell them they're like shoes. I have lots of different <laughs> sizes and lots of styles. She has boxes. I have boxes. <laughs> I have varieties. suitcases of them. <laughs> and so I try to talk to them first before I bring in a suitcase because I don't want people <laughs> frightened and running out of Yeah, the it's understandable. Pall. Yep. And Especially since we're still on that border of this may or may not be acceptable to talk about. Right, exactly. Right, and you're going to do what with that? <laughs> and so, um, you know, we, the, so using diagrams and showing them what things are and letting them know the purpose of this and that it's manageable. They can take it out. They can put it in. I can teach them how to do that. They don't have to. They, they can leave it in there and I can remove it for them on a set interval of every three months if that's what they're happy with. And so it, it really depends on the, women, the woman's decision. And then some people, after they've tried the pessary for a period of time, they think, well, I, I'm ready for surgery. And so that's when, you know, if they've been supported with a, a pessary for a period of time, I always remove that and then have them go and see Dr. Frazandi to see, well, have things changed mm -hmm. since oh. their first okay. evaluation? And then you can have that ask, surgical discussion oh, about okay. what procedure would be best for you. Okay. No, I was going to say, because it's actually interesting where in some cases, if they've been managed with a pessary and have mm -hmm. physical therapy on board, the, the, it can the correct the situation. Yeah, it or? doesn't correct it completely, okay. but it definitely slows down the progression. Oh, okay. To the point where the patient might be comfortable in saying, you know, this is perfectly livable for me. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't have to have something done. And the big question is, when does someone have to have something done? And if their prolapse is really bad to the point where it is obstructing their ability to even empty their bladder mm -hmm. or to have a bowel movement, then we have a more aggressive conversation of doing something. Okay. You know, whether it's trying a press re, um, physical therapy I think is always a good thing, but if it's an advanced prolapse, it's not gonna correct it. Okay. Um, and then there's obviously surgery. Um, and if the tissues are exposed outside of their vagina, then that can also get injured and they can bleed, you know, so it, they're more okay. susceptible to having a bad uh, outcome of some okay. sort. So we, we kind of gauge everybody but I think what Deb mentioned earlier, you know, if, if it's not really bothering them, mm -hmm. we have a lot of patients that will say, you know, I was either told this by my primary care physician or my gynecologist when she was doing a pap smear, um, what, what do I have to do about it? And we take measurements, so we have baseline measurements on everybody. And if they, like I said, if they're comfortable with it and it's not bothering them, then we actually give them the option of just coming back, you know, six months mm -hmm. to a year. Mm. Okay. And retaking those measurements since okay. we have a baseline, um, and then we can have the conversation as to well, are things steady? Do you need to do anything about it? Okay, they're progressing a little bit. Okay. And I think the question that goes on in, in our patients' minds is, well, if I have to have something done, do I want to do it now or do I wait until I absolutely need to do it? Okay. And that's a very reasonable discussion to have because if we know that they are progressing, you know, we've taken measurements or they've come and seen Deb mm -hmm. or seen me, um, and, and we say, you know. We, we take these grid measurements, we call it the POP-Q, and we're like, you know, the numbers are starting to go in the wrong direction. Um, you don't have to do anything. Do you want to? And if they say, I want to, then we have a conversation about what type of procedure they may okay. need. Um, or they can trial a pessary. A pessary is a perfectly reasonable thing. We have people who are so happy with it that they're like, never need anything else, and that's fine. Cool. Um, what we tell them is, what we, we are pretty conservative. We really want them to come every two to three months depending on their okay. exam. Okay. We take the pessary out with the intention of making sure that the tissues haven't been injured by the pessary. Okay. And more times than not, they're not. We, okay. It's usually fine, but we really want to be able to do that. Um, we don't want to put one of these in and then have them disappear for like two, three years. So That would be bad. No, it can be bad. So That would be bad. Um, we, we monitor them pretty closely. And then when they come and talk to me about surgery, we have the conversation about what their expectations are, how badly the prolapse is bothering mm -hmm. 
Um, we have so many different ways of addressing prolapse depending on what kind of prolapse they have. Mm -hmm. Some are minor vaginal procedures, others are abdominal procedures, and the abdominal procedures we're able to do through the laparoscope or even the robotic assistive technique now that the recovery is much faster, mm -hmm. but, but, but we have to keep reminding our patients that the recovery is faster, but we still have a lot of restrictions on our patients because okay. we want everything to heal and get back, kind of you don't put back in get yourself undo. in a worse situation. Right, right. and you don't want to undo all that you know, hard work that went okay. into it. So um, there are a lot of conversations to have. And you know, in the back of everybody's mind is this is elective, right? This is not, so they have to, and it's a lot of our patients have children or they're caretakers for their families. A lot goes into them. And they them can't be out of commission exactly for... Exactly, two months, you yeah. know. Not that, you know, they just can't do any heavy lifting. And that's a pretty big burden on patients. Um, because they are, a lot of our patients are caretakers. Grocery so. shopping! Absolutely, you know. right. absolutely. Deb, yeah. Deb and I, you know, um, and also with Dr. Patterson, um, when we counsel our patients, we do a tag team, and, and we spend a good half hour just going through all the counseling with our patients, because they have to be very clear on what they're going to expect before the surgery and also after the surgery. Because uh, okay. it's a partnership, because we do our part, but <laughs> so much of it happens after the procedure is done okay. and the surgery is done. Because we can do our part and we just put the things back together and then what happens with the patient in the post-op period is really, yeah. really important. Yeah. Put a nanny cam on them. I know. <laughs> That's actually what like they need. Device. Yes. So some, of, some of them are naughty, right? Yeah, Shot they are. They are naughty. And You're not supposed to live. Yeah. And I usually will see them at two weeks and I say, you know, You're you do lifting. not want right. to undo <laughs> all her hard work. She'll be very, very upset. And I don't. I want you to have a good outcome, mm -hmm. so you have to. Don't behave. make her angry. You wouldn't like yeah, her. Really. Don't angry. lift more than ten pounds, and that is a it's that's hard. a challenge. That's like hard. the weight of my cat. You know. It is, and that's why it's yes. so challenging, especially in our younger patients who are so active, on the go, mm -hmm. taking care of everybody and everything. And it's very hard to tell them that. It's very hard. Um, so they have to be ready for it because the commitment's pretty. Yeah. It's pretty intense. You can't really change your mind after. <laughs> no. 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 But the, the commitment's pretty intense. So we, we have a lot of patients who come in and that we rarely book people for surgery on their first visit because the conversation happens and we tell okay. them, please go home and think it through and make sure that you know, you've know you got kind of the village you around you to help you. you. Want to do. Well, plus it probably makes them aware of, okay, how many times do I lift something? Exactly. I did that once actually. I did that, um, I, I think my kids were around four. I mean, they weren't okay. tiny. They were around four. And I remember walking in Carry the door. Carry me. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I remember walking in the door and thinking, how, how would I manage with yep. restrictions? I barely lasted 20 minutes before I inadvertently picked one of them up to do something. And I realized it's very hard for our patients to do that. So, oh, yeah. so it's, it's a big commitment. Okay, <laughs> moving right along. I know. <laughs> I know right. We're like scaring everybody. Like we're never going to do this. <laughs> it might just be a catchphrase again that was on your website, but what is maternal birth trauma? Um, that goes mainly with childbirth trauma. <laughs> Having a kid—that's yes, traumatic enough. That <laughs> exactly is what that's it is. It. That's basically it, and. We, mm -hmm. we see a lot of patients after they've had their delivery, whether it was a vaginal delivery, whether they had to use forceps, sometimes okay. um, those are still what used. What about C-sections? Is that like, what you does know, that do to C-sections can cause other issues, generally not, um, not as dramatically as say vaginal okay. deliveries or even assisted vaginal deliveries. Because you're still carrying a kid or Absolutely. two. Absolutely, exactly. and the data is very clear that just you, you can't tell women, oh, have a C-section because you're going to protect yourself from pelvic floor disorders because the data is clear. There's so many other so, things. Yeah. Exactly. So it's pregnancy in and of itself can cause some of these issues. Not as dramatically as mm -hmm. having, you know, several babies or yeah. big babies, um, but definitely. So we, we can't counsel patients on that. Yeah. So we don't say, oh, go ahead and have a C-section because that's not the right thing to do. I'm either. just laughing because we could file this under TMI, but after <laughs> my first daughter, after my daughter, I had major gallbladder issues and I had a gallbladder attack and I ended up having surgery and the and the, the surgeon was explaining to me that oh well yeah this is common and I said well why don't they tell you this he says they could tell you everything that could go wrong while you're pregnant right these species would cease to exist in right. one generation right I'm like okay point taken right. 
A lot yeah. can go on. Absolutely. A lot can go on. So when we talk about maternal trauma, I mean birth trauma, we're talking about like labor. So during labor, so we know like women in the postpartum um, phase are prone to having urinary incontinence. They can have urgency frequency. They have. Yeah, okay. They can have something called stress incontinence. Um, mm -hmm. They can have some bowel problems. Um, they can have prolapse. So all of these things can happen. Basically, everything that we do can happen after delivery. Um, but we, we recognize, it's kind of what that person said to you, is we have to recognize also Mother Nature has a nice way of putting us back together. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we probably would all stop <laughs> at one. Um, and, and so we hesitate doing anything too aggressively while our patients are in the immediate postpartum phase. Okay. That's where I think physical therapy has been a great, great asset because mm -hmm. we'll get our patients into PT quickly to help them okay. kind of recoup and rehab their pelvic floor um, okay. integrity. Which probably helps like normal without the problem, just absolutely. getting your pre-baby body right. back. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay. And then if- Which I'm still waiting for and my youngest is <laughs> six. <laughs> it happens. Um, so, so we How do that. No, I, mean, I know, <laughs> we're all waiting. Um, so we, we do PT a lot, and I think it's a great way for us also um, to let the patients get kind of back on the path for treatment okay. um, without us intervening too aggressively, because especially if someone wants to have more children, we're not gonna do too much because then they're gonna have yet another pregnancy, another childbirth, another vaginal delivery, and we're not gonna operate on them until they're done having right. kiddos. So PT is great in the kind of in the interim. Yeah. Or else you just, you know, repetitive. <laughs> you just Keep repeating, no, no. <laughs> like then we'd be too busy. <laughs> then you'd be too busy. Okay. Um, you mentioned this briefly, but can we expand on the different kinds of incontinence in women? Sure. Do you want to take OAB? Pick one. That's your favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so overactive bladder um, affects both men and women, approximately 33 million. Um, depending what you're reading um, these mm -hmm. days. It, it goes up, it it's goes down. It's on the internet, it's gotta be true. Mm -hmm. It's, mm -hmm. yes, yes. We have books called Bladder Matters. We have um, medicine out there. That I think the first one way back when was the Detrol, and it was the gotta go, gotta go, right. and that's when I started seeing patients many years ago talking to me about this. So you can have urinary urgency. You can have, where you feel the need to get in there immediately. Mm -hmm. You may have to void more frequently. Um, some patients have to go every 15 minutes. Others can wait two, three hours, but still will get urgency. And with that urgency, at times, they will have leakage of urine. That can be a moderate amount. It can be, oh my goodness, I just emptied my bladder. They call it a uh, several things. They call it the key in the door syndrome where mm -hmm. you've just returned from shopping and you put that key in the door and oops. Or um, bathroom mapping where there mm. are people with these symptoms and they know where every bathroom oh. is yeah. in every store or when they're out and about even okay. driving. Because, and, and many of our elders won't go to new mm -hmm. places mm -hmm. because if they don't know where the bathroom is, they don't want to be found to be oh, in that predicament. Okay. So they won't go out or they isolate. Um, so it involves much counseling because you want to find out what do they drink mm -hmm. because frequently what they feel helps is if I don't want to avoid frequently, then I just won't drink. And that's mm. just the opposite of what they should be doing. They will um, drink coffee and tea and have chocolate, which they're all my favorite things too. Um, so try telling yeah. people not to have coffee, tea, and chocolate. Artificial sweeteners are a terrible bladder irritant. Um, cigarette smoking, alcohol. So we have a list that we give people. Okay. Um, and in that counseling, Here, have some spinach. It's good for you. Yes, <laughs> they well, they do get <laughs> bored with that. Yeah, they they. So um, th it's looking at that information, um, and then it's looking at how do they urinate and trying to um, obtain a voiding diary. So okay. we have them do three days that 
two days that they're going to be home, one day they're out and about or they're at work, let us know what your um, intake is of fluids and what those fluids are, mm -hmm. as well as <coughs> um, measuring urine. Okay. It's not something that you can't bring a hat with you to work. It's no. a, that's just wrong. Mm -hmm. But yeah. but you can at least you know guess um, and just say large amount. I don't I don't need amounts. Um, but I do want amounts on the fluids because many of our patients are under drinking or over drinking. Oh, okay. Now, how much, like for instance, water? How much water should you drink? Or should is a, a strong word, mm -hmm. but suggested. Right. So uh, we will say between six and eight cups of everything. So I'm in Chinatown. So many of my patients have a bowl of soup at lunch mm -hmm. and a bowl of soup at dinner. So you have to, you, that's how specific you have to be when you're asking them. So tell me what you, what you drink and what else, because sometimes they'll tell me, well, I just have one cup of water. And I am thinking there has to be something yeah. else that they're having. And, it, and it's soup or it's yogurt or it's ice cream or it's things that count for fluid, but oh. that Ice cream. They, uh, mm, ice cream. Ice cream. See, cream. there we go. So, um, but when they f when they do these diaries, it gives them mm -hmm. information uh, yeah. that they'll look at it and say, "I had no idea." Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it's, it's an, uh, heightened it's awareness an eye or a realization. Much, yeah. Yes. So it's good for both of us because mm -hmm. it it helps them have the awareness of, okay. "Gee, I had no idea I was voiding this many times per day." Or I had no ma no idea that I was drinking this much, or I had that much ice cream. Dish. <laughs> that I had five coffees, <laughs> you know. So, so that's um, all with artificial sweetener in it. Oh yeah, yeah, multiple artificial sweeteners. So um, then, after they've done completed that information, I will ask them, well, what would you like to? How severe do you feel this is? What's impacting you the most okay. at this point? And if they feel that it's the urinary incontinence, then, all right, what are we going to do about it? Because clearly if you're having five coffees and you're having 100 ounces of fluid a day, this is what we need to start working on. Mm -hmm. And in addition to their fluid titration, you also then look at, well, now let's talk about it's like potty training for adults. Aww. It's bladder retraining drills. And you put them on a time schedule. Okay. So they're timed mm -hmm. voiding, dependent on what they feel they can do. Oh, okay. So if you are sipping that cup of water and it takes you two hours, can you wait two hours before you visit the bathroom the next time? And that's how we'll start. Oh. And then we'll progress 30 minutes every couple of weeks or sometimes every month because they're having so many issues. Some people will ask, could I go on medicine? But that's mm -hmm. not what we start with. We okay. usually start with this first because whether they're on medication or not, and the medications yeah. don't go without side effects, yeah. they're still going to need to learn how to titrate I know their some fluids. some people that are like, oh, well, I'm on medicine, so I don't have exactly. to change my behavior. Exactly. That's the issue. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, so I'm we have high blood pressure medicine, so I can have that, right. you know, cheeseburger with all the salt right. on it, you know. That's exactly the problem. So I, I think we always say there is no yes. magic pill. So right. we mm -hmm. really work on managing their fluids and helping their bladder retrain itself with now the do time. Do you also voiding. try to convince them to have five cups of decaf? Or oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh <laughs> yeah. well, actually, the decaf Two still has oh. has caffeine, mm -hmm. and so I will tell them. There are patients in our practice that can't even tolerate decaf. I don't know yeah. if you're one of those. What I would suggest is why don't you try reducing it to two cups a day and see where you go from there and just see if anything changes. Yeah, I need my coffee or else I'm pretty <laughs> nasty. And they say that to me and <laughs> I understand that completely. Mm -hmm. So I'll ask them, could we, instead of five cups, could we you know, drop that back a bit and start with two? and maybe get to one and see how you are with that. Okay. So it's, it, I always tell them they're a research project and we're just gonna oh, see how it goes. It's an experiment, yep. it's yes, science. Yes, they are, they're a science experiment. It's science. Yes. 
Yes. I like that. And they, and they like it when you say, oh, so I can do this. I said, you can do this. Because no one's ever told them this, there is something you can do to help this problem. They just have suffered in silence. So mm -hmm. it's, it's nice to hear that something can be done. And so I think to add to what Deb's talking about is like we really, and Deb, Deb's on the front line of trying to really manage them in that manner. And if, if we go through the process and even add medications um, to help them with the process and that doesn't work, there are other options for people who have very severe overactive bladder. Okay. Um, there's um, something called tibial nerve stimulation that we can do in the office where it's literally an acupuncture needle that goes right into their lower leg. Mm -hmm. And okay. um, they come in for several sessions and it's hooked up to a little um, stimulator. Shock therapy. That's, <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, it's basically, we're stimulating that nerve okay. to help. It's, it's a great option for some patients, it's not, it's, it goes that are it's afraid not of needles, probably not. Probably not, option. probably not. Um, and then the two other things that are both FDA approved and we've had good success with, um, one is Botox, the same kind of. Really? Really, really, the same Botox that. Okay. Um, so it goes into the bladder. And so Botox. So it doesn't help with the wrinkles. Well, it does that too, but we don't, we don't, <laughs> we're not in that business. We're not in that business. Um, but Botox is a neurotoxin and what it does is it takes the muscle effect from contracting, okay. i.e. going into spasm, which we believe is happening in patients who have severe overactive bladder. Okay. And so Deb will talk to me and say, you know, this person's a good candidate for Botox. I've done all of these steps and we're not getting very far. And so we basically inject Botox into the bladder wall. Hmm. And so the bladder that's going to spasm too much calms down. Cool. And it works really well. Um, few yeah. side effects. Often does good, this Very good occur. question. So we think, this is all still kind of getting teased out, but yeah. we think in most patients it's about every six months. In some patients every nine months. Okay. Um, the other option we have for severe overactive bladder, like, you know, they, they've gone through, you know, Deb's training program and nothing has worked and we get to me at this point. Um, there's also something called a bladder stimulator. It's a nerve stimulator mm. where it's okay. like a pacemaker. Okay. Um, where we implant it in the lower back and there's a little electrode, we do all of this in the operating room, and there's a little electrode that goes into one of the nerves that stimulates the bladder hmm. to try and help it to calm down. Okay. And so Botox, um, the nerve stimulator for the um, bladder and the nerve stimulator that goes into the leg, those are options if Deb and her protocols have not been able okay. to get to a certain point. Now with those three treatments, is there an end date like you can only with the Botox you can only do it six times or that's a very good question you because know after five the years you're so currently the answer is there is no end date okay this is still all being teased out it was approved it's probably the it's the most recent FDA approved treatment for overactive bladder okay. the interstim or the sacral neuromodulator that I mentioned the pacemaker has okay. been around a lot longer than that okay um, so we're still teasing this out. There's some really good studies out there coming out talking about the efficacy of Botox. Okay. But I think, and, and I'm not gonna speak for Deb, I think it's been great because there are a lot of people that aren't good candidates for the pacemaker either. Okay. And I think Botox is a great option mm -hmm. for these patients. Obviously they have to try. Again, we say okay. to our patients, it's not the magic pill, so to speak. We have to do all you of this other stuff. You still need to retrain yourself. You yes, still have so. to do that because mm -hmm. if we do this for you and we still can't manage your fluid or get um, you know, some medications can cause these problems. So if we can't get all of this managed, then it's not going to it's not right. going to work. Um, so there's there's a little bit of um, we have to tread carefully on on what we set as expectations for our patients as well. And but but by the time they go through the counseling and everything, they they know what they're getting into. So it's been it's been great for us. We've had very good yeah. success with it. Um, so how long have you been working with the the Botox treatments? It's been out at least. A almost three years. Oh, wow. We've okay. been doing it for at least two years yeah. now. Yeah. Okay. So it's not like, you know, no, two no, months. No, 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 no. We've been doing that. And in, in okay. Interstim, we've been doing for 10 plus years. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been around a lot longer. And then I want to briefly talk about stress incontinence, which is yep. also something that hits a lot of women. And that's a little different than overactive bladder, where um, we think that this really is a lot more um, afflicted in women who've had the childbirth injuries. I see it a lot, and I think we're seeing it a little bit more in younger women who are very athletic. Okay. Kind of like that pounding, so we think See, that exercise is hazardous. Those runners. Runners. Don't do it. No, I'm <laughs> yes, a lot, a lot of the runner, runners and um, people who do a lot of 
Val Salvador yeah, that's moving what I was around. thinking, you know, mm -hmm. the running pounding, and the pounding effect. And so we think there's some weakening of the pelvic floor. And so when someone coughs or sneezes or laughs really hard, mm -hmm. they leak urine. Now, a lot of women, a lot of women, I'll say at some point in their life, they've had that happen. Like if you have a really bad cold or you sneeze too hard, it happens. But when it gets to the point where Every time. you can't even go and enjoy your Zumba class because mm -hmm. you're afraid of what's going to happen in the gym, okay. um, then that's when they end up um, mm -hmm. coming to us. Um, Deb and I talk about the options. There is a pestry that is an option. It's not great, but there is a pestry that might help them. Hmm. Um, but we have something called a sling. It's called a midurethral sling, which is um, an, a 20 minute day procedure. So it's okay. an outpatient procedure. And we have really good data on it. Um, it's been around for 15, 20 years now, almost 20 years it uh, got started in the uh, Scandinavian countries. And women do very well. They tolerate it very okay. well. Okay. Um, it's like I said, 20 minutes, they go home the same day. Um, we check in on them about two weeks and six weeks. Now, is there like a recovery where they're not allowed to lift? We're, we're pretty aggressive. Yep. I would say we're pretty aggressive. So yep. we really do put lifting restrictions on them as well. I know we have or, a lot of you know, contemporaries. If it's an exercise related thing, do not go to Zumba absolutely, class. Absolutely, absolutely. Exactly. Because exactly. you, you are running. not running the Boston Marathon next month. No, <laughs> no. I, I think we're just aggressive in our clinic because, you know, as I, I guess I'll speak from as, as women, we say, if this was me, I want this to work. Right. So I'm not taking any chances and overdoing right. it. You know, give myself a break, the four to six weeks of no heavy lifting after a sling, and really I want this to work. Okay. And we've had very good luck with it and success, but I think it's expectations. We really set, we really set these expectations at the pre-op visit, the counseling visits, and say, we want this to work. Okay. Because the slings now, you know, across the board, especially if you go to a fellowship trained person, you know, they're put in, in a very standardized way. Okay. And then we want the body to heal and scar and around it, and hopefully it'll work really well. So Now, several years ago on the news, I'm just, you know, it's not on my notes, so feel free to not answer this, but there was the big um, lawsuit with the pelvic mesh. mesh. Is that still around? Is that corrected? <laughs> we spent a lot of time talking about it. I'd like to have people just stop Do watching the commercials. Okay. But, so there were lawsuits. Okay. Um, the FDA put out an advisory. There was okay. one in 2008 and one in 2000 and, um, 2011, rather. Okay. And they were advisories. And what they were talking about is a mesh product that was being used in a particular way in kits, and they were ma vaginal mesh, mesh procedures. Okay. So this is very confusing. So nothing has been recalled. Companies have been recalling their own products because okay. they these but lawsuits. If somebody had that, do they have to go in for no, a follow-up surgery? No, no, and that's or? what and that's what we deal with a lot. I think it's. Okay. I think the commercials have scared a lot of women. Well, yeah, it's yeah. kind of scary. It's very yes. scary. So the commercials have scared a lot of women. So there have been some complications with the mesh kits that were used for vaginal prolapse okay. procedures, and so occasionally we'll see someone that has you know, mesh exposure or erosion, and we can manage that. Um, the big thing that happened that caused the FDA to get concerned is a lot of women were having pain after that. Oh, okay. So we haven't used mesh kits in years and years and years and years. Okay. But they hear the word mesh, and it's terrifying to them. So we spend a lot of time counseling. Um, okay. We do sacrocopal pexies. We do vaginal um, mesh, the midurethral slings. They're all the same kind of material, but we are talking a different procedure. Oh. A different method of putting this um, sling or the copalpexy mesh in. The copalpexy, which is kind of the gold standard for prolapse, okay. has been around over 50 years. So we've been using it. It does fine, but it is. It's been very. It's been very challenging. Mm -hmm. We've had. We've had a lot of patients who come in, and I think we probably should just do a public service announcement every <laughs> now and then. Just <laughs> we know it's out there. You're this okay. is not what we're, You're okay. Yes. But it it has caused. I mean, we we have had patients call us. 10 years after you know they've had their procedure saying, do I need to come in exactly what you yeah. said? Do I need to have this taken out? We're like, no, you're fine, you're yeah. fine. Obviously, if you have any complications or any adverse events, please come in or see the person who did your surgery, mm -hmm. but just because you had a procedure doesn't mean you have oh, to have okay. it undone because of what is out there. Oh, okay. um, so I think the lawsuits are still up and going. Um, most of the big industry um, um, producers have recalled or just take they've stopped manufacturing them okay um so moving forward there won't they, be a problem and, and if it's not right, broken don't right. 
fix right, it. Right, right. Don't get worried about it. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's just caused a lot of worry. We, I know when the second advisory came out, my gosh, the phones were just lighting up because it was our, our own patients that were scared. Yeah. They were like, what do I do now? And we're like, nothing. If you're having a problem, please come in or we're happy to do a checkup. But um, yeah, we're still, we're still dealing with it. Mm -hmm. We're still dealing with it. So we do, even during our counseling, we like show them the material, show them all the diagrams, um, have them even touch and feel the stuff that we're talking about, give them the data. Our societies have done a good job in coming up with a lot of the question and answer okay. pam pamphlets that they can read as well. And we have a couple of good society websites we always tell our patients to go to because I always joke with them. I'm like, I could type up that I'm you know, a rocket scientist and I could say that on the internet, but that doesn't mean it's true. So we it's really, it's gotta be true. It's gotta be true. <laughs> so we really, so, yeah. we really do hand them the pam pamphlets. We do our counseling. We tell them which websites to go to. Um, that are evidence-based and data-driven okay. so they get proper information and so then they can make the right decision for themselves. Okay, now are these websites that you recommend linked to your website by any chance? That's a good question. I think they are, but we can okay. probably just put those on there too. Yeah, okay. one is that, you know, you can put in like the Urogynecology um, Society and that will link okay. you to that. The Urology Society has their own website. The International Urogyne Society has a website. So I think the society website. You're real good at spelling. Spelling, so, well, spell society, <laughs> and then spell gynecology, and then yeah. you'll you'll get yourself linked in. But we really recommend looking at those sites because if you were to put in the word mesh, you'll get legal websites that come up first in Google. Yes, understood. Yeah, so it's been challenging. Now, real briefly, because we only have like a minute left. Oh, okay. Imagine, imagine that. Now, you talked about some of the treatments that have come up in the last couple of years. Where do you see this work going in like the next five, ten years? I think any new treatments on the horizon? I think that you see for coming, I or? think for the major prolapse procedures, I think the colpopexy is here to stay for a while. Okay. I think the lesson we learned was the vaginal mesh procedures, they were hoping that that would take away from the complexity of how okay. Um, big a procedure is with the colpopexy and bring it to kind of less invasive, but I think that that has not had the, the oh, intended okay. um, outcomes. So I think the colpopexy is here. I think with the slings, I think we're going to see more and more minimally invasive okay. procedures for the slings. I think for overactive bladder, I think um, we might come up with other techniques to help patients with overactive bladder. The medications are getting better. Okay. Um, and the nerve stimulation. The nerve stimulation too. is kind of, so yeah. I think we're probably honing in and kind of teasing out some of the details into the um, procedures we currently have. Okay. Um, and I think the awareness is going to be the key, key thing. I think the more people we get into studies, the better information we're going to have for everybody else Excellent. moving forward. Well, great. I'm glad we ended on a happy note. Yeah. I would like to thank you both. Well, thank for you. It was a pleasure. Thank you for coming in. Inviting and us. I want to thank everyone at home for tuning in this evening. Hope you found the conversation as informative as I have. And thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you around town. Good night.